it's so interesting to see how God uh, takes something into a next generation and continues to grow it. Uh, I'm excited to be here for that. I'm excited to walk through your building. I'm excited to see some of your structures. The reason I brought some of these leaders is to see how you have settled in your operations and continue to grow. Um, it talks about vision. And that's exactly what I would like to talk to you a little bit about uh, today is just a trifocal vision uh, and what it means to have a trifocal uh, vision. And I've got a little bit of support on the screen right behind me. So you can just follow on that. God has created us all to be people of purpose. There's nobody here that does not have a purpose. God is very intentional with that. When he knit you together in your mother's womb, he ingrained within your soul a sense of purpose. And purpose is connected to meeting a need. It means that we find satisfaction when we find meaning. And that meaning is doing what God has called us to do. And just like a manufacturer manufactures various things, we see its purpose in how it functions. Be it a phone or be it a car, we immediately understand that this has been designed with intentionality. And God is the master designer. There's no wastage with him. Everything that God does is not only coming from a mind in the moment, but it's coming from an internal mindset. That means that God understood what he wanted to do long before you were even born, a thousand generations before. And so when we come into this earth, we come with a sense of purpose. Our responsibility is to find that purpose. Our responsibility is to pursue that purpose. And pursuit of that purpose is really tied to your vision. What is it that God has called you to do? And I want to talk to you this morning on a few levels. In your own life, I want to talk on a ministerial level, and maybe even just on a broader level. And when we talk about a trifocal vision, I'm asking you to focus on three things in your life, not just one. And we'll put that up on the screen. I'll just do this if you guys can just flow with me with that. This will be the sign for the next uh, screen. But if you can see on the screen behind on a trifocal purpose, there are three levels for me that every person should generally focus on. And the first level is your immediate need. In fact, we don't even focus on it. We're confronted with an immediate need. What is it that you need today? And I'll talk about that in a minute. We call that your daily bread that the Bible refers to. Right now, there are needs that you have that you need to meet. Our need to eat, our need to be in a safe place, our need to pay our bills, our need to cover our families. The second focus is taking it a step higher. And that is focusing on your spiritual need. And this comes from a divine demand. That there's a demand in the spirit realm that requires you to respond to it. Every one of us. One of the things that I've heard Rick Warren talk about is uh, just around ministry. And he says that ministry is not just for the fivefold. Ministry is for everybody. The reason you have a past is to equip you for works of ministry. In other words, his ministry is to get you to function in your ministry. And every single one of you here this morning has a ministry. And that divine demand that comes from heaven, where God begins to look for souls and people that can respond to him and can begin to develop what he has put on the inside of him, begins to meet a bigger spiritual and natural need. And that's where we begin to unlock our purpose. And then the third level is a transgenerational focus. And this is about leaving a legacy. This is where you think about what comes be after you. This is about you planning with your children in mind. This building is a result of a transgenerational vision. This is a next level, a next generation. It means that the founders had thought not only about what God wanted them to do, but those that would come after them. And when you get to that level, you're on another level. You're on a deeper level. You're on a higher level. So three levels I want to talk to you about. Immediate need, divine demand, and transgenerational focus. Can you say amen? Let's go to the next one. So let's start with the first one, your immediate need. And I want to talk to you about a scripture in the book of Matthew chapter 26, where Jesus is preparing for his death. And you know about the alabaster box and Mary coming, this very expensive nard or perfume that she came and she broke it and she was ready to rub his body with this perfume. She was preparing him for his death. And the disciples are there, in particular, uh, Judas has a problem because he knows the value of the nard or the perfume. And he says, uh, you know what, what a waste. Uh, we could have just sold this and we could have fed the poor. And Jesus says something very interesting. We can go to the next one. He says something that kind of had me thinking for a while. He says, you will always have the poor with you. That is a problem statement. You will always have the poor. For Jesus to say you will always have the poor with you means that on this earth we may not be able to solve the crisis of poverty. 
He didn't say you will always have a poor person. He says you always have the poor with you. That talks about how the kingdoms of the earth works. I don't know if you know this. I think South Africa is still there, but we are the number one country in terms of uh, the divide between rich and poor. We're one of the most unequal nations in the world in terms of those that have and those that don't have. And all you got to do is to drive to Sant and to be able to see Alex next to it and realize that the riches are staying next to the poorest. So when Jesus talks about you'll always have the poor with you, he's not just talking about people, he's talking about the system. The system of this world is a system of injustice. It is not a system of equality. It will always focus on pursuit at the expense of others. And I think the sense here is that as long as you're in this world, you will always have inequality. And we'll get to that in a minute. But then he says also, you'll always have the poor with you, but you will always not have me present here. You will not have me. So what you have valued in terms of selling this and giving it to the poor, you have missed the mark. Because what she's going to do with this will outlast feeding somebody. By anointing my body and preparing it for death, I will open up a door that will restore the kingdom of heaven. So this is a worthy and worthwhile investment. To use this nard on me instead of feeding somebody for a day will go a longer way. Now, you mustn't get me wrong here. I'm not saying don't take care of the poor. I'm not saying don't feed the poor. I'm not saying that we should not look after the poor. In fact, the starting point for us to focus on the kingdom is to focus on people's needs. And James says it this way. He says, you say, bless you, brother, and you want to give them scriptures, but they're hungry or they're cold. He says, the starting point is to give somebody a coat and then tell them about the gospel. The starting point is to give somebody a meal. And when they are fed, they can listen to you. Because people that are shivering and people that are cold can't focus on the concepts of the kingdom. So we do have a responsibility to bring the kingdom of God into the lives of somebody. But what Christ is saying is that the world will not Resolve that problem. You got to take it a bit higher because if you want to address inequality and the injustice of this system, you got to bring the system of heaven into this world. And Jesus says it this way, which brings us to our second point, and we'll go to the second level because we don't have a lot of time, which is divine demand. The Bible says that it tells us to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, when he says the kingdom of God, again, you see that he's talking about a bigger concept. Because when he says you always have the poor with you, he's talking about a system. And in order to address the system of poverty, he introduces us to the kingdom. He said the priority above your needs, because your father knows what you have need of. He takes care of the lilies in the field. He understands what you need tomorrow. But he will cover you. If he can take care of the sparrow, he will take care of you. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. In other words, he says, those things are also important. But in your life, prioritize God first. The lady that was doing the offering said it so well. Put God first in your finance. Put God first in your family. Put God first in your health. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and the principles of righteousness from heaven. And all the other things you have need of shall be added unto you. Can you say amen? And so now we see that we have a first level, which is my immediate need. Can I just say something to you about pursuing immediate needs without first seeking the kingdom? Is that it is like a rat race. Because you will always be in need. What God is working at is your contentment, inner peace, fulfillment. Because when is enough enough? If we move beyond the poor and we get even to wealth, when is enough enough? Is it when you reach a million? Because then there's 10. Is it when you reach 10? Because then there's 100 million. Is it when it's 100 million? Because then it's a billion. Is it when you get that phone? Because the next phone is coming out. And the next phone is coming out. Is it when you buy your first car? Because the next car is coming out. There is always somebody that's got more than what you have. And until you have contentment within your soul, you'll constantly look at your immediate needs at the expense of your purpose. How many of us will spend our whole life seeking wealth at the expense of of our health and after we've accumulated all things Solomon says all things are, are not new under the sun Solomon says that we give the things we've worked so hard for to our children who may go and squander it and you spend your whole life accumulating wealth but Christ said set your eyes and set your heart and set your mind on things that are above not only on earthly things don't only have a natural focus have a spiritual focus look at the eternal and not only the mortal try and focus where you will spend eternity and not the temporary dwelling you find yourself in right now can i get an amen somewhere at the back there 
And so I'm saying that, yes, James says, recognize your immediate needs, but don't be caught up with pursuing needs at the expense of your purpose. Don't be caught up with pursuing the next rand at the expense of your calling. He says, put God first in all things and God will give you a proper perspective on what it means to be blessed in the kingdom. You see, there's a difference between just having wealth and walking in the blessing of God. Because when you walk in the blessing of God, you have wealth and contentment. You have money and you have peace. You have health and you are feeling good on the inside. Why? Because the spirit of the living God is working on the inside of your soul and can tell you, enough my child, before greed consumes you. This is far enough. Be content with what you have and know that the Lord is your provider. He's your Jehovah Jireh who will take care of your needs, but do not neglect God in your pursuits. So immediate need and a demand. When you get to the second level, which is a divine demand, we talk about when God comes calling now. Because now you come to the knowledge of Christ. Somebody shares it. You're in a service today. Perhaps you will hear about it today. You've done well for yourself and we recognize it. We can see that you're hardworking and you're disciplined. You've pushed hard. And it's commendable the things that you've achieved. But I'm saying there's a higher level to the things that you have. The spirit is greater than the natural. The natural is mortal. The spirit is it's not only supernatural, but it is eternal. So I want to talk to you about uh, two concepts in this second level, which is where we want to get to. And this is where you start saying to yourself, why am I here? What is it that you want to do with my life, seeing that you've made me God? It's a different conversation. It's about connecting to your maker. In the Garden of Eden, when God comes calling, he looks for Adam and Adam had sinned. Adam is not where he met with God every day. They met in the cool of the day. They had an appointment. Adam was a, a divine being for me here on the earth. Glorified. Could speak to the Father. He was at a different level altogether. A different type of human being. And God comes down to the cool. And God calls out to Adam. And the word that God uses when he calls Adam is Ayeka. Where are you, Adam? Ayeka, Adam. And when he says Ayeka, he's not trying to locate him in terms of where he's positioned geographically. He's not looking for him. It's much more than that. He's God. He knows where he's at. When he says Ayeka, he says, in what state are you right now in your life? Because something has changed in your nature. Ayeka, Adam, where are you at spiritually speaking? Because glory is no longer upon you. Because the language you use is not the language I have given you. You are talking about shame. Where did you learn this? You're talking about your nakedness. You're talking about hiding. You're talking about being afraid. Ayeka, Adam, where did you get this language from? And why are you not at the place where we are supposed to meet every day? Ayeka is a deeply spiritual question. Ayeka, Adam, where are you right now? You know what Adam says. Adam said, no, uh, I'm here, I hid, I ate of the fruit, this woman you gave me. His language changed completely. Ayeka, Adam. God says to you and I today also, Ayeka. You see, Ayeka causes us to examine ourselves spiritually. It causes us to take an account of what we have done with our lives. Because in case you know it or not, you are a spirit being. And God has created you with a purpose. And your pursuit should be Him. And so when God comes, He asks us to do a deep introspection. And asks us, are you where you are supposed to be at in your life? Ayeka, my son, where are you, my daughter? The second thing that God will ask us, when he calls us, is another calling. It's called Ipo. Ipo is not like Ayeka. Ayeka wants you to do deep personal introspection. 
But when God says, I pour my son, he wants to know where are you at right now? Not only where are you at in the bigger scheme, you start with Ayeka, Father, I give you my heart, my life. I am sold out for you. Then God says, all right, you come in the church, I see you. I see that you have served me. I see that you're on this path. But I po, where are you at in this season of your life? And that is my question to you as well. Ayeka to some and I po to others. And there are three responses that you can have when God comes. We'll just stick with Ayeka to you. The first sounds like a Hebrew word, but it's not. Maybe you'll know what it is. The first response when God comes to you and says, Ayeka is Haibo. Do you know that word? Haibo, Jesus. Haibo. I'm where I want to be, not where you want me to be. I'm doing me, Lord. You know, we're doing this whole thing of, I'm doing me right now. I don't have time for what you want to do. Maybe when I'm older, I will serve you. But not at the moment. Haibo. The second response that you can have is po. Like I po, but po. And let's go to the next slide. Po means I'm present. Like when they call your name in class, David, present. Paul, present. Jenny, present. You may be present in the body, but you're not necessarily committed. You're in the class, but did you do your homework? You're there, but are you ready to pay attention? Do you even want to be in school? In other words, I'm present, but don't ask too much of me. I am here because you've asked me to be here, but I'm not here because I want to be here. The OJ sang a song years ago. I don't know if I can say it here, but it would go something like this. Your body's here with me. But, but, the young ones don't know it. But your mind is on the other side of town. God is saying, your body is here in church. Your hands are raised, but your mind is on the pots. Your mind is on that deal. Your mind is on that guy. Your mind is on that thing that is unresolved. I echo and I po. You say po, present Lord, but unavailable. Present, hearing you, but don't ask too much. Present, but don't put pressure. Present, but be happy. I showed up, I volunteered, I'm here, I'm present. But don't make any demands on me. I just want to be here physically. Don't ask me for more. God did not create you like that. You know what is the response God expects from you? When he says, Ayeka, the response is, Hineni. You guys remember? Hineni is much more than present. You know what Hineni is? Present, the answer is yes. What is the question? When God says, Ayeka to Moses, and he has the conversation with him in the burning bush, Moses says after the back and forth, I am present, what is the question? You see, when you get to a high nanny space in your life spiritually, you are sold out for God on that second level. And you are saying that you are not only my God, but you are my leader. You direct my paths. You direct my life. You tell me to go. You tell me to sit. You tell me to stand. And I say, Hanani, yes, Lord, I am present and ready to do what you want. Paul says, what is it before I say yes? Hanani says, yes, what is it you want? I'll say it again. Paul says, I'm here. What is it before I say yes? And then he says, the answer is yes already. What is it that you want? Let me try. Ayeka. Ayeka. In the book of Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8, the Bible says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple, and his angels flew, seraphims, and, and, and they flew around shouting, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And he says, everything shook. And I said to myself, Whoa, I'm a man that is unclean. And an angel flew over and grabbed a coal of fire and put it on my lips. And God began to speak. And I heard the voice of the Lord said, Whom shall I send into this world? And who will go for us? And I said, Haneni Lord, here I am. Send me. God is asking, Whom shall I send? And who will go? What is your response today? Haneni Lord, the answer is yes. What is it that you want? This takes a level of maturity. This is why the Bible tells us rejoice when you face various trials and tribulations because these come to do what? To test your faith. To see if what you say is what you really believe. 
And when your faith is being tested through trials and tribulations, it builds perseverance. And perseverance must complete its work so that you might be mature, lacking nothing. First need, always looking and lacking. Second thing, lacking nothing because my faith has been tested. I am content and I'm living the Haneni life. Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord, send me. You know what pastors want? They want more than any people and less poor people. When we have to do something, we want than any people. Yes, pastor, it is for the work of the Lord. The answer is yes, I'm present. What is it that you want? As opposed to, pastor, let me see what it is you're asking. And then let me figure out if I'm going to say yes afterwards. Thank you. I know that there are many people in this church. You can't do what you're doing here without many people. Can I get an amen? But I want to get to that third level very quickly, but I want to know if you're still with me. The third level is a transgenerational focus. The first is my immediate need. The second is a demand. I wanted to tell you something about this demand quickly. Can I just have a little bit more on this mic? If, I mean, speaker, if you don't mind, guys. Listen to this. When God calls you, Aneni, when he ayekas you, it's because there's something he wants to do in the earth. In the Old Testament, what I find, thank you, that's great, really interesting in the Bible is what I call types. When you look at Samson, when you look at Elijah, Elisha, David, Joseph, Daniel, Noah, you can go through all of them. If you read carefully, you will see that they're not only a type of personality, but they are a type of gift. Oh, thank you so much. Their type of gift. Look at Samson's gift. Samson is different from Elijah. Elijah is different from Daniel with an administrative gift. Daniel is different from Noah. It tells me that when God wants to respond in a season, he's looking for a type of person for the demand that the spirit is making. Because whatever the enemy is raising up in wickedness, God is already raising up the solution in a man or a woman. In any area in this country, look at the kingdom of God. I'm at Siloam. We come from Rock. Wherever you go, there's church today. Because God is raising in the New Testament church types for the community that they find themselves in. And whatever the spiritual stronghold is in a particular area, mark my words, God is ayekaing in that area for the type he wants to raise to solve that problem and bring freedom in that place. Whether it is injustice, whether it is pornography, whether it is substance abuse, whether it is poverty, God is looking and calling ayeka, whom shall I also send? Where are you? And he's looking for a Haneni people that says, I am here. The grace upon Samson's life was to destroy the Philistines who was oppressing the people. So God gave him strength. The power on Elijah's call was to command the heavens and the earth because of the witch of Jezebel that had taken occupation of the nation of Israel. So God needed a prophet that could speak to the heavens because the superstitious and demonic queen Jezebel had introduced foreign gods in the nation of Israel. And God needed to teach her a lesson, so he shut up the heavens to show that you might be in the throne, but I'm still the God that is in power. God will raise up different types for different situations. God raises up a Moses type and make sure that he grows up in the temple away from a slavery mentality so that God can go and send him to set people free. Because God knew a slave can't set a slave free. You have got to have a free mind in order to be able to deliver people from the captivity that they find. So he raises up types all the time. These men and women of God were types that responded to a spiritual demand. What type are you? What is your makeup for this local church right here? Can I tell you that the Bible says in the New Testament, the Bible says the pastor is there to bring people into ministry. You are a type that God wants to use. And Jesus says it this way in the New Testament. He says that we are body. Some of you are hands. Some of you are eyes. Some of you are feet. The hand should never say if I was only an eye. The foot should never say if I was only lips. In other words, 
There's a part that you must play. There's a type that you are. But we can only speak to you on a spiritual level when you've got your nanny right and you're looking beyond your own needs and you're asking your father, yes, Lord, you have blessed me or you're going to bless me. But what is my priority is to put you first in my life. I'm tired of having natural conversations. Let's get to the supernatural conversation. What have you created me for? And why am I at Siloam? What am I supposed to do in this church? Where am I supposed to fit in? How am I supposed to make a difference? The answer is our nanny. Lose my type because there's a demand. There's a need in this church that I am built to fulfill. And how do I know that need? Because the thing that irritates you is usually the thing that God has called you for. And so if you're in the church and you're like, why are there no flowers? Because God has irritated your soul. Nobody else has that problem. Only you have that problem. But you got to understand that when you're spiritual, you can discern your irritation. When you're natural, you compound it. So in other words, when you don't know the things of the Spirit, the thing you're irritated about, you'll give a problem with. But when you understand the things of the Spirit, you'll say, why am I so irritated about sound? Maybe I need to do something about it. We can only work with people that are on the level where they want to talk about spiritual things. Because when you're not on the level for spirituality, then we have to fight with carnality. Even with good intentions. Because this is spirit. And spiritual things must be spiritually discerned. Come up higher. Come up higher from money. Come up higher from personal pursuits only. They could, but let them serve a purpose. Don't let them master you. Money is a means to do something. It's not a master. When it's a master, it becomes a spirit and it will enslave you. Know how to use what's in your hand. Don't be enslaved by it. Your pursuit is the heart of God. Above everything else, your pursuit must be the heart of God. What is it that you want me to do, Lord? And don't say to me, I'm not perfect because God does not call perfect people. He perfects them in the process. With your bro brokenness, with your mistakes, with the things that you're ashamed of, God has the ability to restore you. Because when God comes calling, He comes to heal. When God comes calling, He comes to restore. When God comes calling, He comes to build. God really calls perfect people. He perfects them in the fire of obedience. When they begin to walk by grace, He begins by His precious blood to set you free. So don't tell me I'm still messed up. Come with your messed up self. I know a God that can clean you up. Ayeka, Ayeka, who will come? Because there's a need right now that has your name on it. So let me try and wrap this up. Come out of just personal needs. We know, but more than us, God knows. And he can do something about it. Don't let the thing you need become a distraction and rob you of your purpose. But I want to show you something that I find interesting. We talked about different characters. I want to talk about Abram for a moment. And Abram's response to God, because the third level we're talking about is need, spiritual demand, and legacy. How to look beyond yourself. How to understand that what you're doing is not just for now, but to develop a capacity for the next. How you can operate with a mind that looks at your children and not just yourself. And what will we leave our children? We must leave them an inheritance. We shouldn't leave them with debt. And in order to do that, you don't start when you're old. You start when you're young, thinking about your next generation. So the Lord says to Abram, and he comes to him, he says, Abram, in Genesis chapter 12, I want you to go from your country, your people, and your father's household to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. Look at the promises. And you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. I'll say it again for you. The Lord said, Abram, I want you to come out from your country, from your people, and your father's household. There are three levels there. I want you to come out from the place you have identity, where you have citizenship, your country, your people, where you have a communal identity, and your father's household, where you're being raised in a personal capacity. Come out from the first, second, and third level, and I'm going to take you to a land that I will show you. Notice not that, you, that I'm showing you. In the process, can I say something to you? In the process of the pursuit of your vision, things unfold. 
Don't get stuck in trying to figure it all out. You don't need to know the whole thing. This is going to help somebody. You only need to know the next thing. Two things. God has called me. I don't know the whole thing, but I know the next thing. He will unlock it in the run. As you run, he will solve it. Because that run is a run of faith. It means you're stepping out when you don't know, but you know who has called you. And that is good enough because as you are running by faith, God begins to show you. Have you noticed your car headlights when it's really dark and there's no lights? It just shows you what's ahead of you. You can't see beyond the headlights. But what you're seeing is good enough because the headlights will take you on the road. That is how God calls some of us. Just the next. What is your next? He says, I want you to come out and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse those who will curse you. And your name shall be great because of me. And not only that, and if you are obedient, all the people of the earth will be blessed. The Bible says, so Abram went as the Lord had told him. I want to talk about in this final phase of a transgenerational blessing, just three levels. Abram, Isaac, and Jacob are referred to as the patriarchs. The word patriarch is two words. It's ark, which means senior, and patri or pater, which means uh, beginning of. So Abram is the, the beginning of. Patriarch is where you get the word paternity. When you take a paternity test to see who your father, uh, or, uh, who your father is. Patriarch is where we get the idea paternal. It is the beginning or the source. God is our pata. He's our father. He's the originator and the source. And I want to talk to three types of people in this uh, room for the last few minutes that I have. The first is to the Abrams, the Patas, the beginning of anything, the beginning of a vision, the people of the promise, the people that carry the vision on the inside of them. We learn certain things from Abram, and I'm going to rush through it if you don't mind. Abram was given a promise at 75. He was told to leave everything and God was going to give him a son. In summary, it took 25 years before God fulfilled that promise. You're waiting two years and you think it's long. You're waiting four years and your business hasn't turned a profit and you think it's long. Abram waited 25 years. And in the waiting for a son, his body aged and his wife's womb closed. But the Bible says Abram would not waver in unbelief concerning the promises of God because he knew that God was faithful concerning the things that he said. So instead of grow, as he grew older, his faith grew stronger. As his body grew weaker, and even though he faced the fact that his wife's womb was as good as dead, he continued to put his faith and his trust in the living God. 25 years. Isaac was born when Abram was 99, going into 100. 25 years for the promises of God to be fulfilled. And all Abram had going for him was to say, God told me to leave, and God said he will figure it out, and we must trust God all the way. Don't trust God some of the way. Don't trust God most of the way. Trust God all the way. Because some of you and some of us have given up by most of the way. Because by most of the way, we are tired and we've waited long. God says a little bit longer. Just wait and continue to trust me, because when I come, I will come quickly. Abram is the beginning of something new. It might be the first business in your family. It might be the first graduate in your family. The first doctor or the first lawyer that he's trying to set up. It is the first of something where you're coming out of what was and coming into what God wants to take you into. It might be that you have a line or a lineage. When you look back, you find teenage pregnancy, teenage pregnancy, teenage. My mother gave birth to me when I was, she was a teenager. Her mother gave birth to her when she was a teenager. Her mother gave birth to her. You got to be the line that stops that in your family. It might be alcoholics. My father drank. My grandfather drank. My great grandfather drank. I will be the line that will stop that. It might be uneducation. My father dropped out in matric. My grandfather dropped out in standard eight. My great grandfather dropped out. But I will go all the way. You are an Abraham. You are the breaker of a line and the beginning of a brand new line in your life. You are the end of one thing and the beginning of something else but can I tell you because you are the first of that thing it's going to take a while because some of the demons you're fighting are transgenerational demons that want to attach itself to you you are not only fighting for what is in the past but you're also fighting for what is in the future you are standing in between you are the person in the gap that will change the life of your child to make sure your child is not like your uncle and your father God
God blessed them, they tried, but you want better. You got to be the person that says, it stops here. Poverty stops here. Illiteracy stops here. Teenage pregnancy stops here. Alcohol abuse stops here. Fear stops here. The demon of depression stops here. I'm going to slay them. It may take me 25 years, but I'm not doing it for myself. I'm prepared to lay my life on the line so that my child and my grandchild and my great-grandchild begins to walk in the promises of God. Abram is the one that breaks the curse and brings in the promise. And Abram says, okay, I didn't get the degree, but I, I will make sure that my child gets the degree. So your son becomes a doctor because you labored and you gave your life so that the next generation can be a generation of graduates. Are there any Abrams here? Nobody had a business in your life. In your family line, you are the first and it has been a struggle. But hold on, Abram. Not for yourself, but for your children. They need you to hang in there. And it may cost you your whole life. But three generations will thank you for the sacrifices that you have made. They are cycle breakers of curses. They bring in the blessings. They stand between poverty and between war and peace. Between addiction and deliverance. Between shame and glory. The partners of the promise. Father, may you bless the Abrams in this place. Because when I spoke about it, they knew it was them. They knew that they are the first in that line. They knew that they've got to go through extra lens. But it's been 20 years for some and 10 years for others. It feels like a long time. But you are not a man that you will lie when you call us. You will ensure that your word comes to pass. Your word will not return back unto you void. May the word of God be accelerated in the lives of the Abrams that are here this morning. May they find renewed strength and vigor in knowing that the promise giver is a promise keeper. In Jesus name, amen. Carry on, Abram. But let's go to Isaac. Isaac is the seed of the promise. You know what it means to be the seed? Is that when you have the business idea on the inside of you, it is still a part of you. So when you die, it will die. But when it's given birth, the thing you've talked about, I'm using business as an example, and the child is born, the child is separate from the man. The child is now nurtured. In other words, what God has put on the inside of you has manifested. It may not be the harvest, but it is the beginning. You can see it. Others can see it. You can walk away from it. It's growing. Like a company. Do you know that when you register a company, it becomes its own identity and person? And yes, it's in an overdraft, but you've registered it. You're offering the service. It's not making the money yet, but you can see it. it's no longer here. Isaac represents the manifestation of the promise in its seed form. I'll tell you very shortly about Isaac. So when Isaac was a couple of years old, let's go to the next one in Genesis chapter 22. The thing that Abram had waited his whole life for. And we're going to wrap this up like this. God calls Abram some time later. And guess what? God says, I poe Abram. Where are you at right now? You know what Abram says? Haneni. I am still here. Genesis chapter 22, you'll see there, if you can put it up, the scripture. Here I am, he replied. I am still here. Then God said, now take the son that you love, that you waited 25 years for. Take him on to Mount Moriah. I want you to go and sacrifice him there on the mountain. Oh. I come to you during COVID and I say to you that, uh, you know what, just after COVID, family, I took my pension fund, I started a business. I've invested all my money in that because they were retrenching at the company. And I've worked hard for it. And today my testimony is that after three or four years of not having any financial success, going through the hardest difficulty in my home, not being able to pay the lights and the water sometimes, I'm struggling. I'm giving you a testimony. Not mine, but I'm giving you a testimony. And in the first year, God kept me. And in the second year, He kept me. I felt like giving up. My marriage was on the rocks. I didn't know which way to go. The banks were calling. They wanted to repossess the buckies because I'm offering a service in that area. I couldn't take their calls anymore. I didn't know what to do. But I kept on because I know that what God has given me has manifested. I see my Isaac. He's not grown up, but I need to nurture him. And after the fifth year of struggling, I stand out before you. I say that the Lord has blessed me. I'm in the first in my family to own a brand new car. God has honored his word. And finally, God's promises has come through. Hold on to that testimony. 
And so the Bible says the next morning, Abram gets up immediately because our nanny means, yes, Lord, whatever it is, it's yes already. I'm ready to go. And he takes Isaac up to the mountain. It takes three days. And when they get there, the boy says, but father, the wood is here. The fire is here. Where is the sacrifice? God says, my son, the Lord will provide the sacrifice himself. And they get to a place and you can imagine how hard it must have been for this man who waited 25 years, willing to lay his own life down for this boy. And the Bible says that Abram begins to put the boy and wondering, where is the Lord? He takes out the knife and the boy is there. And he reaches a point. You see, this is a point of no return. That, okay, I thought God was testing me, but I guess this is it. And as he's about to bring the knife down, he hears, I pull Abram. And what does he say? He says, I'm still here. I have not moved my spiritual position even though you asked me a hard thing. This is the worst thing you've asked, but I'm still here. And the answer, Lord, is still yes. What is it that you want me to do? And so I testify and I say, yeah, pastor, I bought myself the brand new ML. Please come and see and pray for it. And the pastor prays for it. And I get into my car and I drive home. And the Lord says to me in that moment, go back and give the pastor the car that you've waited for for five years. Some of you are already saying, Aish. And the next day you come and you give the pastor the card because your answer is I nanny. And driving, they said, you won't believe it. I waited five years for this, but the Lord has provided this now. And he said, I must give it to you. Pastor says, oh, wow. This is a blessing. I just gave away my old 20-year-old Datsun. He says, can I drop you off at home? He says, no, I need to walk home, Pastor. This, is a, this was a big ask. And the Lord calls you and he says, I pull and you say, Aneni, I'm still here. And the phone call comes through and the Lord says to Abram, now I know that I can trust you. Take your son off. I've provided. Look there, there's the lamb. Now you will see the blessing of the Lord because you have shown me that the thing you wanted the most will not control you. I am still your God. And because your anani has never changed, because your anani has never changed, I will be faithful and the Lord blesses him. 75 years he could spend with Isaac and had many other children. And the phone call comes through and says, hey, we've just looked at the review. We want to increase the order nationally for your buckies. Have you got the capacity to go 10 times bigger? This is how God works when you know how to say yes in your final moments. So I close with Jacob because I've got two minutes. But what we want, we want the Abrams and the Isaacs. But what we want more than anything is the Jacobs. Because Abram struggled with one son. Isaac had two, he had others. But Jacob is an interesting person. I'll tell you a quick story, then I'll sit down. Because I'm saying... We want more Jacobs than Abrams. Because Jacob represents the harvest of the promised. Abram rep uh, Isaac represents the seed. And Abram is the parter. We want to move from promise. We want to move from seed. And we want to move from harvest. And Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Because when the babies were in the womb of Rebekah, the prophet said, you have two nations on the inside of you. God is now in the third generation fulfilling his promise through your life. And Jacob's name, when he lies on a, a rock, he has a vision of heaven. And he says, the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. It's this, it he did not know it because it's that same place in Bethel where God had spoken to his grandfather and said, I will make you a great nation. And God changes his name after wrestling with an angel and says, you will be called Israel. And the sons that will come from you will be like nations. I offered Abram a son, but I told him nations will come, and nations came from Jacob. And I'll contextualize this with you with a story, then I'll sit down. I started a company, Pastor, and I'm first generation. I didn't know anything about registering businesses. I didn't know how VAT works. I didn't know nothing. I just knew that I needed to start something. And a few years into it, the business struggled at the beginning, and it eventually did a little bit well. And I was driving, I don't know, was it a Golf 3 GTI or Golf 5, and I was feeling good about myself. And I shared this with our church that I pulled up at the stop, I think, in Rosebank. And a guy pulled up next to me, and he's driving a very fancy sports car. 
And I think I was already in my 30s. But this was a 20-year-old. And I think it was a very flashy car. It could have been a Ferrari or I don't know what. The top was down. And I could see that this is a 20-year-old. And I said to myself in that moment, Lord, how is it that at 20 he's driving a Ferrari and at 30 I'm driving a Golf GTI? I started a business and I've labored so long. And I felt the Lord say to me, because your business is 10 years old and his is 110. He's not a first generation businessman. He may not even be a second generation businessman. When you look at the company registration, it's 1910. Yours is 2010. You can't compete with a Jacob when you're an Abram. Because they're carrying a multi-generational blessing. So that what you get right at 40, he'll get right at 20. This is why you must make sure Jacob's come from you. Because Jacob don't have to start building. The building is there. All they got to do is multiply the work and the blessing of God is there. Because Jacob represents the harvest of the promise. Not the beginning, but the full manifestation of what God said is going to happen. May the Lord raise more Jacobs because God knows we have too many Abrams. I said, may the Lord raise more Jacobs because God knows we have too many Abrams. We can't keep starting and starting and starting. Fathers, learn to give over so your sons can take it further. We don't compete with our sons. We want them to be greater than us. We want them to do bigger things than us. We want them to go further than us. They are not our competition. They are our blessing. So I shout to you today, Ayeka, 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 God bless you this morning.